Hello, everyone, and welcome to the opening of Uradala University's feature presentation, Wixel's Depression Star. And it will be everything you never knew you wanted to know about what you might not know that interest rates know. Just what all that actually means, exactly who is Wixel and why his star might be so depressing, we'll find answers from none other than, brace yourselves, Ben Bernanke. Maybe not the Bernanke you know or could be expecting, though. In fact, much of this presentation, even quite a lot of what we do at Eurodollar University, builds from and remains aligned with mainstream economic thought. We diverge from it really in just the one area, but it is a big one, as you'll see as we go through this material. That distinction makes all the difference in the world. In fact, without realizing this, you'd think everything is upside down. Up first in part one, we begin with thousands of banks failing, including several big ones. Deposit flight, Wall Street rescues, Fed emergency loans, the first bank holiday since the Great Depression. March 2023, we begin with the seventh largest U.S. bank in serious, I mean serious trouble. It had just borrowed $3.6 billion from the Federal Reserve's discount window, and the Fed was instrumental in arranging a $4.5 billion line of credit from 16 of the usual suspects lined up across Wall Street at the behest of Morgan Guarantee. Are we talking about Silicon Valley Bank? First Republic? None of those. A firm called Continental Illinois. And this was not May or March of 2023, but May from March 1984. Continental Illinois wasn't just a large bank either. It was a well-connected, interconnected bank. In fact, the term too big to fail was coined from Continental Illinois, not Bear Stearns, not Lehman Brothers, but this failure, this one bank, this SNL, way back in the 1980s. And the reason it was too big to fail, the reason it was so interconnected, all came down to a single word, Eurodollar. In fact, Continental Illinois had, had arranged 40% of its liabilities, 40% of its funding from this Eurodollar system. And we'll come back to all that in just a moment. But it begs the question, if this was the original too big to fail bank, why don't we remember that name? Why doesn't anybody think about Continental Illinois in the same way that we, we're going to remember, say, Lehman Brothers for the rest of our lives and well into the future? Something else to ponder as we move forward. But Continental Illinois was obviously not the only bank in trouble. Another bank called Home State Savings Bank near Cincinnati, Ohio, triggered a run on SNLs in the state of Ohio, so serious that the governor of Ohio actually shut 70 SNLs, all of those that were subject to state regulators and state deposit insurance. It was the first bank holiday, first widespread bank holiday, too, since the Great Depression. Yet, I'll bet nobody remembers this. Nobody's probably ever heard of this. And it wasn't just a minor bank holiday either. Not only was it 70s SNLs that were closed, who were only supposed to be closed for a couple days, they ended up being closed for several weeks as the deposit run continued to drag on into the future. All of this begs lots of questions, but starting with the fact that once Continental Illinois failed and that spread into other banks around, around the rest of the country, these SNLs and the SNL crisis, there was, by the end of it, thousands of banks that ended up failing. Yet, as I've just said, hardly any of us remembers the bank holiday in Ohio or the name Continental Illinois, despite the fact that these were major issues at the time. In fact, we don't really remember the SNL crisis at all, except for maybe a footnote in history, because the 1980s and forward were remembered instead, not as a second Great Depression, as many people had feared, but as the beginning of an age of un- paralleled global prosperity. Now, before we continue here, just a note, I am only showing the FDIC data by the number of banks that failed in each individual calendar year, not by assets or deposits or anything like that, but it does. It, this is good enough for our own purposes here, for comparison's sake. Fast forward to the 
2008 crisis when far fewer banks failed, but we remember those failures. We remember them very well. And we also notice the difference. Once AIG and Bear Stearns and Wachovia, Lehman Brothers, all the rest became part of our mainstream lexicon, what followed from it was the opposite of unparalleled global prosperity. Constant unrest, upheaval, increasingly conflicts around the rest of the world. Now, there are obviously protests and upset and dissatisfaction during the period of the 80s and 90s into the 2000s. That's nothing new. But the degree to which these are happening, the degree and seriousness of global conflict seems to be escalating in a way I think we can all agree is very, very, very different from what happened in between Continental Illinois and Lehman Brothers. Something is going on here that is not just about individual bank failures or even groups of bank failures. Bank failures by themselves cannot explain what has, what has transpired over really the last century or so, but in particular, the latter half of the 20th century into the first part of the 21st century. Notice also the difference here. Lehman Brothers, AIG, Bear Stearns versus Continental Illinois and Homestank Bank. SNLs, those are not. When we look back on the SNL crisis to begin with, what we find, or what the FDIC found, was that most of those that were growing quickly, therefore, then most of those that got themselves into trouble along the way, were those banks like Continental Illinois that had begun experimenting in what we call today wholesale funding. Things like large denomination deposits, mostly large denomination deposits derived outside the United States, which Eurodollar University members know of as, as the name says, Eurodollar deposits. They also got involved into repurchase agreements. Yes, repo. So we have these SNLs that were heavily involved in wholesale funding in the way that these other banks were using all along. In other words, Continental Illinois was trying to become like Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers many years before those would actually fall into the same category. Keep that in mind also as we move forward. This unparalleled global prosperity from the 80s, 90s, into 2000s, where did that actually come from? Well, according to Mr. Ben Bernanke in 2004, it came from the Federal Reserve. He said that he put his case forward for monetary policy being the primary explanation for what came to be called the Great Moderation. Of course, the, the researchers who coined the term Great Moderation, James Stock and Mark Watson, weren't convinced. In fact, they said in what was unique about the Great Moderation was the eerie absence of breakdowns in the monetary system that would lead to the periodic depressions as the United States and other parts of the rest of the world had experienced throughout history. Which is odd when you just consider we just went over in the middle 1980s, late 1980s into the early 1990s, a massive bank crisis. So here was James Stock and Mark Watson marveling at a great moderation, a period of unparalleled global prosperity that was unmarked by monetary disruptions, but it was obviously marked by banking disruptions. Again, there's a distinction here. Not for one by, like Mr. Bernanke was saying. Mr. Bernanke in the 2000s, as a member of the Federal Reserve's top level policymakers, said, no, we did this. We created the great moderation by learning from Paul Volcker. And we all know how it's supposed to work. When the Federal Reserve believes that inflation is going to be a problem, when the economy is getting out of control too hot, it raises not all interest rates, but one single interest rate, the federal funds target. And it raises that rate and says that rates are going to be tight. And conversely, when it wants to stimulate an economy that might be a little bit lethargic, not behaving according to Federal Reserve aims and goals, it will lower this one interest, not all interest rates, this one interest rate and calls it loosening. You can probably already smell the bullshit. 
pardon my language. Because we're supposed to believe that the Federal Reserve created a period of prosperity unparalleled in human history by doing nothing more than raising and lowering the federal funds rate target a little bit here and there. Sometimes up by a quarter point, sometimes down by a quarter point, and somehow that created enormous global prosperity, even during and after one of the major banking crises in U.S. history. Yeah, it really does smell like bullshit. Not, not to mention, just starting with the fact that that's backwards. As Milton Friedman said throughout his career, but again in the late 1990s when talking about the Japanese experience, high interest rates are never associated with tightening and low interest rates are never associated with loosening. Interest rates in the great inflation, inflation, were rising, were going up, were high. And interest rates during the Great Depression or in the Japanese Depression of the 1990s were falling, going lower. As he said, calling it the interest rate fallacy, high rates moving higher are associated with loose monetary conditions. Low rates going lower are associated with tight monetary conditions. The exact opposite of what the Federal Reserve wants us to believe. To understand interest rates, let's go back to a fellow by the name of Newt Wicksell. In 1906, he gave a presentation for the British Economic Society or the economic section of the British Association, something like that, in which he, which he observed the rate of interest, the natural rate of interest, is never high or low by itself, but only in relation to potential profit and perceptions of profit which people can make with money in their hands. And of course, this is never the same over time because we live in a dynamic world and try to use a dynamic economy with dynamic financial markets that factors and parameters are constantly changing. But as Wixell pointed out, in good times when trade is good, rate of profit is high, therefore interest rates are expected to remain high. And when the rate of profit is low, interest rates are expected to remain low. And what he said was, in periods of depression, interest rates are low, echoing Milton Friedman, or Milton Friedman actually echoing Newt Wixell. Depression economics, interest rates are low, not high. And what he said of specifically financial interest rates or monetary interest rates, when the interest rate is low compared to profit, that means prices are likely to be rising. But of course, what does that do to the banking system? Banks are thought of as safe places to store funds. But in a economy that's doing really well, where the, the profit or is thought to be ex exceptionally high, therefore the natural interest rate is exceptionally high, safety is going to have to compete with the real economy for funds because money is going to want to go to where it can earn the best profit, best risk adjusted profit. If there's profits to be made in a booming real economy, and even an inflationary nominal real economy, that's where money's going to go. So interest rates are going to rise for both the nominal economy as well as for the bank that has to compete with the real economy for cash. Again, this is the opposite of what we're talking what we're led to believe. So our star is what economists call the natural rate of interest. And we can think of our star along with D star, which I don't know if there's supposed to be a star, but I just threw one in there. Why not? D is, of course, the demand for money. S is the real star, though I don't want to spoil it just yet, meaning supply of money more generally in systemic terms, just for illustration purposes here. And then those together combine to create an, an interest rate, say an average or overall benchmark interest rate. As Wixell said, when the economy is really good, what do we expect to see? Well, we expect to see our star rise because think about it from this perspective. If you can make a huge profit in the nominal economy, say 20% per year doing something, creating a new business or expanding one of your own, then interest rates on money can rise and you can still afford higher rates. So demand for money goes up and the demand, those who are in demand for money, borrowing money, will pay it because the opportunities in the real economy are robust. So if you can make 20% per year on doing something in the real economy, 
You can pay and afford double-digit interest rates in order to take advantage of it. But notice here something too. Supply will go up to meet the interest rate because if there's a high demand for economic interest rates or economic – for money to be used in the real economy, then supply will, go, will be enticed to meet demand. In this respect, as economists assume, demand therefore creates the supply of money. This is something we're going to come back to later too. But how does it work the other it, in a more realistic sense? Not quite totally realistic, but thinking about what Wixel had said in his presentation. What he said was there's kind of two different interest rates or two different classes of interest rates. There's the interest rate that goes along in the real economy as well as the interest rate that banks have to pay to attract funds into their vaults. We can think of this as the interest rate on risky propositions in the real economy versus the interest rates on safety, whereas the interest rates on safety are the bank vault. Again, when the, when the economy is robust, demand for money goes up because we want to use money in the real economy, which means the interest rate that these riskier projects are willing to pay goes up too. And as Wixel said, supply is going to be created by demand, which means that safety is going to have to compete for money. So the interest rate on safety or the interest rate that banks are willing to pay, which was safety in Wixel's time, that has to go up too. So just as we said before, just as Milton Friedman pointed out many years later, the interest rates go up when there's money flowing freely through the economy, when the economy is being highly accommodated by money. Interest rates on both risky stuff as well as safety rise, all under the umbrella of our star or the natural rate of interest. Again, we assume demand creates supply, and it all works in the way Milton Friedman again pointed out. What about the opposite direction? What about when business is not good? Or as Wixell had said in 1906, when R star goes low because of depression, depression in economic activity. What would happen here? Well, the demand for money would, would naturally fall. As the demand for money falls, obviously the supply adjusts to that. And so it would make sense that, again, going back to Wixo, the interest rate for safety would go down too because banks no longer have to compete with the real economy for funds. In fact, the demand for safe places to store money would go up through the roof. The bank would find itself with – and just, just to make a distinction here – banks that are not in trouble. So good banks would find themselves with no trouble finding funds to put into their vault. So the interest rates that safe outlets are, are forced to pay – would go down toward and even to zero. But what about the interest rates for risky projects or risky efforts? Would those go down? Would they below be less than R star? Let's come back to that one too, because that raises several key issues that we need to go through and unpack as we move forward. Now remember what Mr. Ben Bernanke says is that Interest rates are the product of the Federal Reserve. So if interest rates are low, we're supposed to believe that the Fed is stimulating the real economy when, as Friedman and Wixel had pointed out, that can't be the case. While the Fed may raise and lower its federal funds rate, that doesn't necessarily apply to the other rates. Is it actually trying to affect money demand? Well, that's what we're led to believe. That the Federal Reserve is trying to manipulate money demand by lowering interest rates to entice demand and by raising interest rates to constrict demand. But again, it doesn't seem to work out according to historical precedent. And what about the supply of money? What about S star, the real star here, the real star that we focus on with Eurodollar University? What the Federal Reserve has said openly, if, you lo if you're willing to look for it, is that, number one, we don't actually pay much attention to money supply. So because we can't define money, because we can't regulate it, monitor it, or even really influence the real legacy of Paul Volcker, we sort of don't pay much attention to 
money supply to begin with. In fact, this had changed in the 60s into the 1970s, where more and more Fed researchers, as well as economists and academics, began to focus strictly on money demand. Because if you assume demand creates supply, and if you can't really monitor and regulate supply or define it, then it makes sense that you would focus exclusively on money demand. But, as Alan Greenspan would admit much later, they stopped being able to track money demand all that well either. So they can't track money supply, and they don't really have a good handle on money demand. So what are they doing with all of these interest rates that are supposed to be manipulating money demand and assuming that supply will follow along as everybody wants? As I said before, can you smell the bullshit here? What Ella Greenspan was saying is that we don't know what we're doing with the monetary system, either supply or demand. Instead, this is why you'll see, for example, policymakers even today, like Jay Powell, talk about the unemployment rate or the CPI or PCE deflators, the Fed likes to in the 21st century, but essentially macroeconomic variables, not monetary variables, because they don't do supply. They simply assume that demand creates supply. And as far as demand goes, they don't know how to influence it either. They're just assuming that if the CPI stays low and the unemployment rate is low too, then they've done enough manipulating on money demand and however that impacts money supply that everything just happens to be working out all terrifically. We end up with something like the great moderation when policymakers, economists, and academics don't really know for sure exactly what happened in between. So you can understand Stock and Watson's reluctance to embrace the idea the Fed created the unparalleled global prosperity of the great moderation. But what is actually going on? Money supply, money demand, really? Who is the star? Why is, why is S the real star here? That plus unpacking the difference between the SNL crisis and the 2008 crisis, why bank failures are not important, instead it's something else. All of those and the appearance of Mr. Ben Bernanke to answer many of these questions, That's we'll save that for part two of Wixel's Depression Star. Thank you very much for joining me for part one and look for part two in the near future. Hey, thanks for making it all the way to the end of Wixel's Depression Star Part 1. If you want to see Parts 2 and 3, the thrilling conclusion, those are available for Eurodollar University members at the Eurodollar University membership site, where you'll find a whole bunch of other material, including the basic series. Now, we uploaded basics number 7 and number 8, going on the background of bond curves and money curves, those are available now on our YouTube channel. You can check them out there. But the rest of the basic series, as well as a whole bunch of other stuff, more presentations, there's 26 classroom videos, question and answers, weekly recaps, an entire resource library. All of that's available for Eurodollar University members. And on top of all that, we have research subscriptions available. A daily briefing where every day I go over the day's most important macroeconomic developments, as well as what's happening in the marketplace. And on top of that, we also have a deep dive analysis subscription where every day we go very deep into current events from the perspective of our euro dollar understanding. So we've got background material, we've got the research subscription, what's going on today, why it's happening. Check out our Christmas sale. The best prices we have ever offered on all of it, including a bundle where you get the deep dive analysis, the daily briefing, as well as a membership and all the benefits that come with it for one incredibly low price. Check out all the information, including the Christmas sale, at our website, eurodollar.university. Again, thank you very much for joining me. And all of you, please do take care and have a Merry Christmas.